This is the fourth, third lecture in the Spirituality in the Brain series, and tonight the th there are two themes, enlightenment and the self. And uh, the reason that these two themes come together is that um, in order to understand what enlightenment is, how it works, how it happens, you have to understand something about the self. What is the self that is being enlightened? And but the obvious place to, add, to begin is with the question, what is enlightenment? And um, there are two traditions that deal in enlightenment, actually three, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. Um, the most important of these are Buddhism and Hinduism, and most of the material that I'll be working with on as far as the subject of enlightenment is concerned comes from the Buddhist tradition. And I'm not married to any one particular Buddhist tradition. I got my training in Buddhism in Southeast Asia, where it's called Theravada Buddhism, which roughly means the way of the elders. And um, I'm not too well schooled in, the, in Tibetan Buddhism and the Mahayana traditions of China and Japan. Um, but they will have some representation tonight. Um, it's, enlightenment is understood differently in these traditions, in Hinduism and Buddhism. But one thing that every tradition that upholds teachings about enlightenment they all have in common is the idea that enlightenment leads to constant unending bliss. And in neuroscience, the notion of constant bliss actually has a, um, uh, a, a source that we can pinpoint in the brain, which I'll be getting to fairly soon. Um, in Hinduism, uh, enlightenment is actually called moksha, a word that literally means liberation. And if you are enlightened in the Hindu tradition, it might mean that your self has united with God. It might mean that your true self has been realized. It might mean that you or yourself have been illuminated. Or it might mean that your ego, a word that has never been defined precisely enough in spiritual traditions to satisfy me, has been destroyed. Buddhism is much simpler, clearer. Um, in Buddhism, the self is extinguished, it's put out. And literally, the, the word nirvana means to put out a light. And it's the same word that is used to refer to snuffing out a candle, um, which always reminds me of the, uh, the line in Alice in Wonderland, where Alice, actually reflecting Lewis Carroll, uh, has experiences which he puts into her mouth as, I seem to be going out like a candle. And uh, without getting into it too much, I'll say that that would appear to be an instance where the brain's involvement in maintaining the sense of self is interrupted, and you can actually um, stop existing for a few moments. Um, so in Buddhism, the self is extinguished, and its illusory nature is revealed. Buddhism is very clear about, actually it's very vague about the self in many regards. It takes long training in Buddhist psychology to get some of the deeper teachings, but um, one thing it's clear about is that there is no such thing as the self. And it has a doctrine called uh, the doctrine of no self, sometimes anatta. And in that tradition, um, the word anatta means no self. An is no Atta is self, and you have, no, you have no self. For now, it's okay if you don't fully grasp that, because it will be clarified as we go along. Now, one essential difference between Hinduism and Buddhism is how the self changes in the process of becoming enlightened. And I like this illustration because what we have here is a man who's looking at an image of himself while creating an image of himself. And uh, the multiple levels of perception that are involved in trying to look at the self become, um, become clear. And uh, of course, this is a painting by Norman Rockwell, and uh, I've always been very fond of his work. So when it comes to the neuroscience of the self or the sense of self, not too much has been known until about 10 or 15 years ago. Prior to that, there were psychiatric disorders that were described as disturbances in the self or disturbances in the sense of self. But um, it didn't really move from psychology to neuroscience until this man, 
brought his expertise and research tools to bear on the issue. Now, this is Dr. Michael A. Persinger, and he's director of the Laurentian University Behavioral Neurosciences Program. He's been my mentor uh, since about 1995. He has over 350 uh, peer-reviewed medical and uh, academic journals uh, citations to his credit. He's published more than almost anyone else alive. He's in, certainly in the top 5% of most published scientists, and everything he does, almost without exception, is peer-reviewed. So when I bring his concepts into this, I'm bringing hard science, consensual science, well-reviewed uh, research that has had the opportunity to be criticized from many, many quarters. And after some 10 or 15 years, his uh, notions are standing up to the test. In fact, some of you may have seen him on uh, TV documentaries about things like near-death experiences, alien abductions, and so forth. And um, he developed a model of an experience that I'm sure some of you here tonight will have had, and it's called the sensed presence. And uh, the sensed presence refers to that feeling that someone is standing behind you, or someone or something is behind you, and you turn to look, and there's no one there. And this is different from the sense of being stared at when someone is staring at you. But um, he's put a fair amount of research into understanding this experience. And it so what he has been able to show us is that the self, again, or the sense of self, is primarily a matter of the limbic system and secondarily a matter of the cortex, the outer layer of the brain. And in this illustration, you can see uh, a kind of very simplified schematic of the limbic system outlined in black. Um, again, the sense of self is primarily a limbic, a deep brain uh, structure and a structure, a set of structures that are sort of buried in the temporal lobes, the parts of the brain that are right over your ear. And they come forward as a kind of thumb-like projection, st uh, sticking forward a bit. And there, it's, the structures in there are extremely specialized. Um, we're going to see this illustration a couple of times in the course of tonight's presentation. And if you look, the amygdalas, actually there's two of each of these structures, one on each side of the brain. The amygdalas are round bits in this illustration. And the one on the left is specialized for positive emotions, joy, bliss, elation. Um, there have been people who've had their amygdala stimulated in a method that we'll be using a method that we'll be talking about fairly soon. And it can be almost as though when the amygdala is suddenly activated that you've just received good news, like something really nice has happened and you're, you're quite excited about it. Um, the amygdala on the right is quite the opposite. The amygdala on the right is specialized for fear, depression, words come up like angst, despair, uh, a sense of impending doom. The amygdala on the right is really a bad boy structure and if you could certainly work with your brain structures hands-on, that would be the one that you would want to keep turning down all the time, as indeed we'll be finding the process of enlightenment does. Um, and then moving back to the left side of the brain, these kind of cylinders below our, our round bits, we have two structures, the hippocampus on the left and the one on the right. The one on the left deals in words, and it has a fairly pessimistic outlook. It deals, beyond that, it deals in thinking. It thinks the things that we're aware of ourselves thinking, however subtly that may be. And on the left, that's in words. So the deep brain part that handles a lot of the words that your brain has come in through your ears, or that you produce for your own inner thinking, uh, involve uh, activation of the hippocampus on the left. The one on the right is a much nicer structure to work with if when it's active and uh, that one deals in silent thinking and it also seems to have a fairly optimistic outlook. If something happens and it, the right hippocampus is involved in interpreting it, it will tend to think of it as good news. Sort of assume by default that whatever it is, it's going to work out well for you. Um, very optimistic, very forward-looking, very positive. Um, then we have two other structures here represented with a couple of very skinny, long skinny triangles. That's the caudate nucleus. 
These are fancy names for actually reasonably simple operations. The one on the right does relaxation. The one on the left does arousal, states of excitement, uh, having your body filled with energy. Anything from sex to that last sprint as you go towards the, um, the finish line, for those of you who are still young enough to think about racing. Um, and we don't hear too much from it, but it's important to understand that the side that does happiness does arousal. And the side that does unhappiness does relaxation. And those of you who've had moments of depression will probably realize that when you're depressed, you tend to be a bit lethargic. You just don't have that much energy to get up and do things. Even if there's something you can think of that might improve your mood, finding the motivation to get up and, and actually address that thing can be quite hard to do. Nothing beats a sofa and a television for depression. Um, so this, we'll see this diagram again, so don't worry if you haven't absorbed it. Um, and I see a question. And does this part of the brain have something to do with falling in love? And uh, yes, the caudic nucleus is instrumental in romantic love. It's also instrumental in sexual desire, but only on the left side. And uh, the experience of um, expansive, undirected love has also been reported with a stimulation of the left side of the brain. Um, and from those reports, the people didn't say that they were necessarily thinking of people they loved and going into the feeling. They just felt love. And the best word for this in English actually comes from Greek, and the word is agape. And when Christians say they love everybody equally, uh, whether they experience or not, they're alluding to a state of consciousness that comes from this word agape. There are many varieties of love, and yet each one of them seems to implicate the left side of the brain in one way or another. So let us return once again to the sense of self. So here is our diagram of the limbic system once again, again embedded in the cortex of the brain. And you'll notice the two of them are highlighted blue, the round one, the amygdala, and the cylindrical one, the hippocampus. And those are the most important deep structures for maintaining the sense of self. And the other areas surrounding it, the temporal lobes and the frontal lobes of the brain, are heavily involved, especially the temporal lobes. The frontal lobes are also involved, but they're less important. So primarily, the sense of self is temporal lobes, right here, and limbic system, these deep structures that you'll see on the diagram. But let me make things more complicated for you, as if it were already simple. You've got two senses of self, one on the left side of the brain and one on the right side of the brain. And um, ordinarily, these two work together quite seamlessly, but they're not equal. They're actually, uh, the one on the left is the most important one. It's what we call the dominant one in neuroscience and the other is the subordinate one. And the reason that the one on the left, and some of you who are here for the first talk may remember some of this, these thoughts, the reason the one on the left is the dominant one is because that's where the language centers are. And when you find the word self in the phrase self-esteem, or you find it in sense of self, we're talking about the same entity, the same beast, so to speak. We maintain the world through a constant process of reconstructing it, primarily through the words we use. Whether uh, hard things are hard and soft things are soft and squares are squares and circles are circles, we don't need internal dialogue in order to maintain. But our sense of ourselves, our thoughts about ourselves, the stories we tell ourselves about who we are, are very much dependent on words and maintaining a constant stream of words in our minds. And this tends to uh, keep the whole process going. Without that process, things tend to fall apart quite quickly. And in fact, shutting off the internal dialogue is one of the core processes of many spiritual disciplines. And its function is to break down the world a bit, make our sense of ourselves a bit fuzzier so that we're not so locked in and it allows an opportunity for other things to come through. Um, 
Our self-esteem, and again, that's the same self as in the sense of self. Our self-esteem rises and falls according to what other people says to us. Someone says, you're cute. We feel good. Someone says, oh, that's, those shoes are awful. And we, it's our shoes. It's not ourselves. But still, we tend, to, we tend to be a bit crestfallen when that happens. Somebody says, you're hired. We feel great. The approval, the acceptance that goes with this. Somebody says, you're fired, and we feel awful. The seeming rejection that comes when your boss tells you, gives you your pink slip and it's time to go. Um, we take these things very, very personally. A string of words from a teacher, you're doing great and we feel wonderful. You didn't pass the test and we feel horrible. Um, our self-esteem depends very much on the words that we, um, that we have coming into our minds and the stories we tell ourselves in our minds tend to buttress our self-esteem. Uh, Benjamin Franklin once said that he didn't understand this Christian thing about vanity and pride. He said he'd given himself many a happy evening's hours simply sitting in front of the fire and remembering all the fine and wonderful things he'd done in, in the course of his life. And now he could tell himself, what a cool guy I am. And he actually managed to bolster himself up. And I don't know the details of that, but I'm sure he did it uh, at times of his life when things weren't going so well, far more than he did when things were going along, as he might have said, swimmingly. Um, now, the linguistic sense of self takes an awful lot of doing to maintain. In order to have one that functions, you've got to learn language, including grammar and syntax, all the connotations of the words, perhaps a touch of a sense of how they might be used poetically and so forth. Um, there's a great deal of brain process involved in maintaining the linguistic sense of self. So much so that some people can actually, uh, spiritual practitioners, can actually get the feeling that their normal ongoing sense of self is an obstacle or a burden. I'm in regular contact with a Carmelite nun who once told me, and this is a contemplative order. They don't go out and help the homeless. They stay in the convent, in the hermitage, uh, wherever they happen to be assigned by the church. And they devote themselves as much as they can to keeping the holy hours, lauds, matins, vespers, and things like that, and prayer. All day long, every moment, only doing that. It's quite an impressive thing. And she was telling me how she had the feeling that the fact of her own individual existence was what kept her from the goal of that tradition, which is called the Unio Mystica, the mystic union, or rather the union with God. And the single most elegant statement of this that I've ever encountered comes from the Bengali poet and Nobel Prize in Literature winner, Rabindranath Tagore. And in his book, Gitanjali, which is the book he won his Nobel Prize for, he says, addressing God, Beautiful is thy wristlet, decked with stars and cunningly wrought in myriad colored jewels. But more beautiful to me thy sword, with its curve of lightning like the outspread wings of the divine bird of Vishnu, perfectly poised in the angry red light of the sunset. It quivers like the one last response of life in ecstasy of pain at the final stroke of death. It shines like the pure flame of being, burning up earthly sense with one fierce flash. Beautiful is thy wristlet, decked with starry gems, but thy sword, O Lord of thunder, is wrought with uttermost beauty, terrible to behold or to think of. The self, the normal ongoing sense of self, is a burden, especially for those who are looking to find something richer within themselves. So back to the sense of self. That's a high point to step down from, but the sentiment is awe-inspiring and really does orient us at what we want to be thinking about here. Now, ordinarily, the two senses of self, the silent one on the right hemisphere and the talking one on the left, are seamlessly integrated. The sense of self on the left downloads, takes contributions from the one on the right constantly. It takes in whereas the one on the left deals in the denotations of words, what words mean. The one on the right deals in connotations. It deals in aesthetics, uh, all kinds of relevant nonverbal information, um, as well as the impact of things like poetry 
or the difference in a single sentence spoken by a small child where it seems terribly cute and spoken by an adult where it can actually become imposing. Um, this is where the right, the linguistic sense of self is reaching over to the other and getting some extra contribution to it so that the meaning and the feeling and the sense of the words can be changed. The left handles the meaning of words, the right handles the sense of words. And most of our conversation, there's always a sense of our words that goes a little bit beyond dictionary definitions for them. Again, the left denotes, the right connotes. Now sometimes, the communication and connection between the two senses of self can break down. And there's a few ways this, that this can happen. One side of the brain can be compromised in some way, while the other remains normal. Um, once, if it's though the two of them are interlocked and once in a while they can sort of fall out of phase and connect together in unusual ways. And <clears throat> when this happens, the subordinate sense of self is projected outside of ourselves where we experience it as an outer presence or in the technical language of the scientific literature on the subject, an ego alien entity, an entity that is somehow external or alien to yourself, your, your I, in the original sense of the word ego. And the sense presence, uh, sort of parenthetically, because we're not going to be following that too far with this in tonight's talk, uh, is a mild example of a visitor experience. And when you start taking more intense examples of the visitor experience, you get actual, you don't just sense the presence, it can actually manifest into something more. You can hear words from it, you can actually see it visually. And it might appear, according to the research on the subject, as an alien, as a demon, an angel, uh, some satanic creature, um, invisible friends in childhood, monsters in the closet, and at its very peak, God. And for those of you who were here for the first talk, you will remember that um, visions of God have been produced in the laboratory using the technology that has produced so many um, uh, sensed presence experiences. It can also happen the other way, so that during this moment of breakdown between the two hemispheres, uh, the silent sense of self becomes the dominant one, and you feel yourself without words a tremendous inner silence can take over. It can be quite frightening because remember that fear structure is also on the right side. Uh, and the other one can be externalized. And in a moment like that, you can expect to hear the voice of God, the voice of an angel. Some satanic, hissing, malevolent, scratching voice might appear. Um, but this is definitely the exception. The rule is the subordinate sense of self, the silent one, is the one that gets externalized. And the dominant one, the, the one that works in language, stays, remains you. So this is a picture of the equipment that was used in these experiments. Uh, this is the Karen helmet, also known as the God helmet, and it has featured in a number of documentaries, so some of you may have seen this before. And. Um, Again, parenthetically, 2% of the subjects who received stimulation from this device um, saw God. And these people in complete sensory deprivation, absolute acoustic, total silence, and complete blackness. That's actually hard to manage at home. But 80% of them had the experience of sensing a presence. So the sense presence is very, very, very much more common than visions of God or demons or aliens or anything like this. Now, in one of these experiments, and this is the one that's crucial to what we're uh, talking about now, um, when the subjects were asked to focus on that presence they felt around them, the presence moved so that they would, uh, they would feel a presence off to their left and behind them somewhere. They said, okay, tell us a little more about it. You know, what does it feel like? Uh, is it male or female? And as soon as they did that, the presence would change its manifestation somewhere. Let me now show you another picture that will describe the actual protocol used to do this. 
And what happens is in the first phase of the experiment, a certain signal, kind of a, a random, semi-random signal that the brain responded to, but didn't actually, wasn't actually designed to produce any specific effects, was applied to the right side of the brain. This would activate the right side of the brain in general, and the result was often that uh, the person in this first phase of the procedure would become very frightened. Their right amygdala would get involved in it, that fearsome, fearful, bad boy structure. And the next thing you know, they'd be in a state of real terror. It would occasionally happen that they would literally call out, this is enough, I can't take any more, stop this. Whereupon immediately, without waiting for the normal 30 minutes to elapse, the researchers would move to phase two. And in phase two, now in the first phase, the amygdala, the amygdala on the right would get um, activated, creating fear, but at the same time, the one on the left would become very quiet. When that joyful, uh, exuberant, exultant brain structure was once again brought into the picture, it would burst into awareness, it would burst into activation, and instantly, in a matter of less than five seconds, the person would go from a state of extreme terror, which at the, that was the most extreme that these experiments could do, um, to a state of extreme bliss, whereupon now the, the news from the little microphone in the acoustic chamber would say, don't stop this, keep going, I like this. In fact, if you spoke to them uh, while they were in this state, they would become irritated because the state of consciousness would be interrupted. As, you expect, as they were expected to pay attention to the researcher's words and not their own thoughts and feelings. In the second phase, a signal was used, a magnetic signal, whose shape was derived from uh, a specific pattern of amygdaloid activity. It's a, a burst firing pattern, if you want to know the technical name for it. And as I mentioned before, 80% of the people who experienced this would experience a presence in the chamber with them. Um, now these are applied over the temporal lobes on each side of the head. First the right, then both. And again, just to remind you, the sense of self is primarily, at least as far as the outside of the brain is concerned, a temporal lobe phenomena. Um, psychiatric distor disorders that are described as disturbances in the sense of self invariably make changes in these brain parts, the limbic system and the, um, and the temporal lobes. In some of them, the temporal lobes can actually start to shrink on one side as it gets used less and less. And uh, there's a rule in the brain, in the, the brain's operation, which I'll be referring to again, use dependency. In the vernacular, everyone knows it. If you don't use it, you lose it. Um, the, in schizophrenia, the hippocampus on the left side, the one that works with words, is actually larger than the one on the right because it gets so much extra work to do with the disturbance in their sense of self and the amazing florid outflow of language that schizophrenics um, can come up with. If you are a poet and you are ever short on inspiration, just lock yourself in a room with a schizophrenic Keep your pen and paper handy and you will have stuff to take away with in no time. Those people produce words. I once had a ne next door neighbor who went into a schizophrenic episode while I was living next to him. And I remember unlocking my, uh, the door to my apartment and going in and hearing from his apartment, um, get down you ruffians, said the princess to the, what was it, the waffle vendor on the horse. Makes no sense at all. And yet the way he said it, it sounded like it really meant something, like there had to be a symbolic value to it. People can get locked into coming up with strings of words, um, especially when the hippocampus on the left side or the temporal lobes on the left side are working too hard. I once worked in a nursing home, and uh, there was a patient there who repeated all day long, every waking moment without exception, the same chant over and over again. When she ate, she would take a bite, swallow it, then repeat her saying, then take another bite and repeat it again. And what she said was, and these words will stay with me for the rest of my life, I'm sure, is, if I have to live in this world, Lord, if I have to live in this world, let it be on toasted eggs and toasted eggs and toasted eggs until the world is gone, until the world is gone. 
I don't know what was happening in her mind. I'm a brain scientist and I haven't got a clue, but something was going on there. And again, this illustrates the, uh, the extent to which um, disturbances in the sense of self, psychiatric disturbance can so warp out the function of the brain that you can get locked into something and not come out of it again. And this, when it happens in a different way, um, we like it very much. So it's good to look at some of the other functions of the temporal lobes. And in addition to being the source of the sense presence experience, as well as uh, the source of many spiritual experiences, including things like gods and angels and so forth, uh, as well as being uh, crucial in our use of language, both internal and spoken. It's also the source of raw emotions. Remember those round things, the two amygdalas, the one does elation, joy, and bliss. The other does fear, terror, despair, and anxiety. And this is kind of the emotions they produce without our thinking about them, without our processing them in any way. Raw emotions. Um, it's also involved in meaningfulness, the sense of that uh, something happens and means something, uh, means something personal to us. And I did it the first night, but I'll do it again tonight. My favorite story about meaningfulness comes from a, a neuroscientist, who, which is how it got into the literature where I could read about it woke up from a dream in the middle of the night. And in this dream, the secrets of the universe had been revealed to him. Whatever it was he encountered on the other side had given him a magic formula, and this formula contained a profound and deep truth. He had the presence of mind to write it down. Went back to sleep, woke up the next morning, you know, went to the toilet, shaved, took a shower, then he remembered this piece of paper on his nightstand. And he knew there it was, the, the content of God's mind at the moment of creation, the thought that explains the fabric of the universe, the most powerful single statement that he was ever going to have in his life was there in his bed stand and he went over, picked it up and read it and it said, a strong smell of turpentine pervades throughout. It wasn't meaningful because the strong smell of turpentine pervading throughout was a powerful sentence. Because in the, the moment when he got it, he was so filled with a sense of deep meaning that that sentence had to be important. And so because of the sense that pervaded his being at the moment when it came through, it could have been nothing but the secret of the universe. In another moment, it meant nothing at all. Um, and then the last one, the one we're going to be looking at a little bit here, is hallucinations. Now, I don't like referring to these studies because they involved uh, animal vivisection, and I want nothing to do with that. But it was done in the 1950s. They were some of the first LSD studies ever done. And so I apologize on behalf of all of neuroscience for the animal experimentation, but let that not keep us from learning something from it. And what they did was they gave monkeys LSD. This was very soon after LSD had been invented. And uh, they gave monkeys LSD and they could tell that the monkeys were hallucinating. They were tripping. And uh, they opened up their brains and removed different sections of the brain, closed it up, had them heal, and then gave them LSD again. And no matter which part of the brain was removed, the monkeys tripped. The monkeys had the behaviors that go with hallucinations. Uh, may those monkeys reincarnate well for the service they have done mankind, however small it may be. But the one part of the brain that actually cut off hallucinations was the temporal lobes, the part of the brain that is so instrumental in, in maintaining the sense of self, that is so instrumental in maintaining our sense of the presence of others, as well as the sense presence experience that we're trying to, I'm trying to keep at the center of this discussion. Here's a case in point, this time no monkeys. These, uh, the flashing red lights point, denote two aneurysms in the blood supply to the brain in the temporal lobes. And this was the case of a woman in her mid-30s. And uh, the doctors went in and did an angiogram and they found the source of her troubles. And her troubles were musical hallucinations. She was having hallucinations of music almost constantly and usually the same music over and over and over again. Well, you try listening to um, 
Stars and Stripes Forever for about five years and see how you like it. Naturally, she went to the doctor and they figured out that she had this problem in her right temporal lobe. That's where musical appreciation and apprehension is. And they went in there and removed the aneurysms, closed her up again nicely and neatly. And when she came recovered from surgery, she found uh, that her hallucinations had stopped. Hallucinations are based in the temporal lobes. Let me get back to the theme now that we've got that locked in. And the theme once continues to be the sense of self. Now this is Adi Shankara, the first Shankaracharya, the Shankara teacher of Puri. And he's the founder of an important school, the Advaita school in Hinduism, if I'm not mistaken. And he is the one who came up with the phrase, many, some of you will be familiar with, neti neti, which means not this, not this. Actually, you can be neti 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 neti, not this, not this, not this, not this. Um, I would have liked it a bit if he'd had a not that in there somewhere, but the point is um, that you could look inside and try to see your sense of self. You could look um, in your thoughts, and your thoughts, you are not your thoughts. Look at your emotions. You are not your emotions. Perceive your body, and you are not your body. So, I actually think that he was almost right. It isn't a case of not this, that you look at thoughts and feelings, and it's not this and not that. Rather, what I'm getting through my researches and thoughts on this subject is that it isn't here and it isn't there. The sense of self is not in your thoughts or to be made from them. It's not in your feelings or the things that make your feelings. It's not in your body or the things that keep you internally connected to your body. When you would look, when we're, when we're thinking normally, we have a sense that we are where the field of thought is happening. When we have emotions, that's where our emotions happen. But when you zone in on them, each and every time they will disappoint you. And looking for yourself in yourself is a wild goose chase. Not just a needle in a haystack search, but you're actually barking up the wrong tree. A statement with which Adi Shankara would, I'm sure, uh, emphatically agree. In any case, uh, the reason I'm making a point of this is that the sense presence, which moves and changes when you focus on it, um, behaves just like the sense of self, which moves and changes when you try to focus on it. So again, back to that sense presence. Um, but again, the sense of self changes when we focus on it, the sensed presence changes when we focus on it, and the same thing happens with hallucinations, especially in the single most common context for hallucinations. And would anyone here like to guess what the most common circumstance in which hallucinations appear is? I see eyes wide with expectations, but no hands up. It's very close, not dreams, but rather the moment when we're falling asleep. That's what you were going to say? I thought it was going to be about a God or a sense of God presence. No, a uh, sense of God presence is quite rare. But that would uh, be a good thing to, uh, to corral into this discussion. That moment of twilight sleep when your brain is shutting down one part at a time um, is the moment when things are most likely to be out of their normal relations with one another. And that creates an opportunity for hallucinatory phenomena to appear. Speaking for myself, I've seen faces, um, sometimes enorm unspeakably beautiful f women's faces, just coming through my visual field with my eyes closed, one after the other. Um, landscapes, just awe-inspiring, tear your heart out, you want to cry. Landscapes going through my head, sometimes with incredibly rich 3D effect. Then I drop off to sleep and, well, the next thing you know, everything's all integrated once again. But that time in, in the twilight of sleep is the time when you are most likely to break up into your inner parts. And if you have the presence of mind to look at it, you can confirm Adi Shankara's statement um, that you are not this and you are not that. Is that in the theta state? Is that in the theta state? Um, it is a, th a theta state. 
And that's worth mentioning, going into just a little bit. Thank you again for the question. Um, the theta state is a state that uh, appears in trance, um, hypnosis, and meditation. And it's possible that there are multiple sources for the theta state in the brain. But right now, according to some recent work that I've read, it seems to be reasonably likely that the right hippocampus, that silent, uh, that structure that thinks without words, may be the source of all of it, as well as the imagery that can come in dreams or in the state when you're falling asleep. So, um, the other thing that's worth saying about hallucinations is that they can occur to any of our senses. And I'm going to ask you to let your mind open a bit and stretch the definition of what is a sense a bit here. Uh, here we have a well-known illustration of an hallucination. This actually is a set from a set of Victorian postcards that illustrate the song, The Lost Chord. Someone plays a chord, something happens, and they feel themselves surrounded by some beatific, divine, um, benediction and feels themselves in the presence of angels and even God from a single chord and then they go on looking for that chord and they never quite find it again and this this lo the lost chord becomes a metaphor for the longing for the presence of God um, it's an auditory and emotional hallucination the picture partly be I put it in partly because it's a very cool picture and well I wanted to you can have visual hallucinations, as anyone in the room who's ever taken an hallucinogenic drug will know. You can have olfactory hallucinations, which are more common than you might think. You smell something, and it's a faint smell, and it's gone. And then, well, that was my neighbor cooking. That was somebody down the road smoking pot. That was a cigarette from the guy downstairs. You just get a brief whiff of it, and it's gone. But it can often happen that if you look carefully into the source for a smell, you'll find there was none. Um, occasionally in meditation I've had the smell of burning wood and I would jump out of the meditation to go and check around where you know where's this coming from is, is the apartment on fire no it was just the same involvement of the amygdala and its connection to the olfactory bulbs firing away and I was getting a smell you can have gustatory um, hallucinations you can taste things that aren't there this isn't so common but once I did spend six weeks with the most exquisite cappuccino you could ever imagine in the back of my throat at all times. You can hallucinate tastes that are not there. You can have tactile hallucinations. The single most common one, and almost everyone's experienced this at one time or another, is that you get the sense that there's a bug crawling on your skin. And you, you look down and there's nothing there, or you, you brush it away and you, you've brushed nothing. But giving that little bit of stimulation to the spot can shut the hallucination down. So, the sense of self arises out of the temporal lobes, especially with its deeper limbic parts, so do hallucinations. And this inspires my interpretation for the human sense of self and gives an explanation for why the Buddha said there was no such thing, and that's because there isn't. The sense of self is an hallucination. Now, those of you who were present for last week's talk, I promised that when in this week's talk I would tell you whether the sense of self, whether you as individuals can reincarnate. And the answer is no, because it's not something that's intrinsic to your being. It's something that's created. And once you, if you take rebirth into another body and build up a new body-mind complex, you will create the neural substrates for this process once again and go on existing without having to have it be carried from one life to the next. That's a kind of a big jump for tonight's theme, so I won't spend much time there. But again, the sense is, the self is an hallucination, a constant, functional, ongoing illusion, just like so many of the world spiritual teachers have told us that it is. And um, its function is to unite everything that happens to us internally and externally into a single core that, that the rest of our system can identify with. So that if you stub your toe, it's not a toe being stubbed, which you can be pretty dispassionate about. It's my toe being stubbed and then I have to stop my walking and lift my foot and rub my toe a little bit. It, it makes me take all of the things that come together 
in my perception, thoughts, and emotions and forces me to respond to them, which forces me to act in such a way as to keep this system alive where I can do things like meditate, possibly become a Buddha, but certainly um, have the opportunity to pass on my DNA and carry on the cycle of life and continue to be a survivor or even a winner in evolutionary terms. And that is one of the assumptions that is the foundation for everything I'm saying tonight. We are the product of biological Darwinian evolution, survival of the fittest, and so forth. So, which of your senses tells you what you're feeling and which of your senses tells you what you're thinking? If I move my hand, you see movement. That's visual. You know which sense that is. Uh, I, I throw a, a book of matches and it hits you in the shoulder. You know which sense that is. But which of your senses tells you what you're feeling, what emotion you're experiencing now? We smooth it over in our language by saying, I feel angry, I feel happy. But in point of fact, there is a sense that perceives it. There's a sense that knows what you're thinking. And that uh, sense jumps into the act when you find yourself thinking thoughts that really are not typical to your personality. And um, so, um, there is a sense that per, in which this hallucination is happening, the sense of self, but it has no real percept. Now, I happen to think that it may have one that's somewhat real, and that is that just as we project a part of ourselves outside ourselves in order to have the sense of a presence, in order to be in the presence of an angel or God, we also project part of ourselves out onto other people where they become very much more real and very much more solid than they are when the, our sense of self is locked within ourselves. So that if I'm in love, I project that love onto my beloved so that it is not just that she is loved, it's that I love her. And so, to an extent, the extremes of emotions that we feel about other people, hatred, irritation, and love, are manifestations of the same sense of self. So that when the uh, mystic poets talk about I and my beloved becoming one, um, they're alluding to something very profound. Here we have the thalamus uh, in this diagram. And the thalamus is the area where our thoughts, emotions, and our sensory perception all come together. And at that level, all three of them are equal. Thoughts, feelings, and perception are all equal players on the board of consciousness. So the distinction between perception, thoughts, and emotions becomes a bit um, artificial to the thalamus. Higher up in the brain where most of us live most of the time, it's the, this distinction is quite meaningful. I smell a rose. I think E equals mc squared cognito ergo sum, the square of the hypotenuse is equal. Now one of these senses, all of which are so equal on the playing field of the deep brain structures, perceives the self. It only perceives from inside the mind. It has no perceptions that come from outside. Everything else is through the lens of our consciousness and interpreted in terms of its relevancy to ourselves. L thinking about the self in involves the recognition that on one level, no matter how much we love our children, our dogs, our lovers, our parents, God, we are self-centered beings, and that's the way it's supposed to be. So again, we perceive ourselves from the inside only, through a glass darkly, when we try to focus in on it, we lose our grasp, it moves, it goes away, nothing we look at introspectively will ever be the self. And this sense that gives us the feeling that it's there has only one percept, one thing to perceive, and that is an hallucination. The theme tonight was enlightenment and the self. We've done the self. Let's do enlightenment. And there is a picture of the one I was taught to refer to as the Lord Buddha. So, there are three questions about enlightenment that I can presume to try to answer in the context of tonight's talk. One of them is, actually four, one of them is how does enlightenment happen?
as far as activity in the brain is concerned. The other is how does enlightenment alter or change the self or the sense of self? Another is how does it create bliss? And another is why is enlightenment so different in different individuals? Some enlightened people have psychic skills and some of them don't. Some enlightened people perform miracles and some of them don't. Some enlightened ones teach and others go into silence and say nothing. And I'm not sure what tradition it originates from, but a Buddha who chooses not to speak, above all, not to speak about their personal experiences, is called a muni, a silent one, which word I believe comes from Sanskrit. And what we have here is a popular uh, Southeast Asian illustration of the Buddha's miracle at Shravati, Shravasti. And um, in this miracle, and this one is actually reasonably well known in the Buddhist worlds, the Buddha, when challenged by an, a rival spiritual teacher to perform a miracle, to prove that he actually had achieved the states of consciousness he was talking about, made multiple copies of himself. So that one minute there was one Buddha standing there, teaching, explaining things, and the next moment he was surrounded by four other Buddhas, each one of which were lying in, in their serenity and silence. And the other teacher took one look at this scene, was completely blown away, and immediately decided, this is the guy, this is it, and stopped being the teacher of his own disciples and became a disciple of the Buddha and brought all of his disciples along with him. There are many such stories in the life of the Buddha. So, as will probably not surprise many of you, the neural basis for enlightenment is the same as the neural basis for the sense of self. The limbic system here, again, that same diagram you saw before, embedded in the cortex, the outer layer of the brain. The core of the enlightenment process, and remember I'm not talking about it as an event, but rather as a process, seems to be in the limbic system. And after enlightenment, other changes happen in the cortex. And I've mentioned the amygdala, the, the two round things at the top with their functions of joy, bliss, elation, um, happiness on the one side, fear, anxiety, despair on the other. But I want to give a few words about the, um, the hippocampus, that cognitive structure, the one that thinks with words on one side and without it on the other. It's been called the brain's contextualization engine because it takes things and puts them into context. Or it can take a seemingly isolated perception and find a context for it. I have this somewhat imposing illustration. And this is an experience that has gotten the nickname the void, uh, partly from near-death experience researchers because it happens in the course of near-death experiences. It can happen in the course of peyote visions. Uh, I've talked to two people personally, but I haven't found it in the literature. Uh, two people who had head injuries uh, fell down and hit their head a good solid one, enough to make a bit of a concussion. And for a second or two after, they would find themselves with their eyes closed, staring not into the dull black space behind their eyelids, but rather into an infinite void. And this void has an interesting characteristic. Even though you perceive it visually, it has a tactile quality. It vibrates. It's got a texture. It seems to communicate something, but then remember it's coming out of the right side of the brain. So it never gives you the words to, to know what it's communicating. And the hippocampus on the right side is also involved in spatial perception. It has our inner maps. So you know the way walking, perhaps even walking half asleep from your bed to your front door, down the street to the nearest corner store and then back again. You've got a clear mental map. You've got another mental map that you could probably mentally impose on <coughs> a road map that will take you from your home to work or the nearest city. Um, if you're really an experienced driver, you might be able to mentally plot your way from your bedroom to Times Square without too much inaccuracy. These are inner mental maps and they are handled or mediated uh, or retrieved by the hippocampus, which retrieves another class of subjective experience, perhaps an even more important one, and that is memory. 
The hippocampus takes experiences in the present moment and turns them into memories that we can retrieve, often altering them in the process. Most of our memories are false memories that we have embroidered a little bit to suit our purposes or our psychological needs for the moment. How many of you here, just raise your hands, have a memory of being on a beach? Okay. How many people can actually see themselves on that beach? We get a few more, not quite as many hands, but we get a good number of them. So here's my question. Were you having an out-of-body experience while you were at the beach? No. So where's this memory that in which you see yourself at the beach? It is a false memory. Not deeply falsified, and there are some that are. A large percentage of, of adult recall memories of childhood abuse are actually false memories. If you were abused as a child and you remember it continuously through your life, you were abused. But if something happens and then suddenly you spontaneously recall it later in life to lend context to some traumatic or shocking, shattering thing that came up later on in life which, uh, for which you could find no context. So something happens that changes your brain so severely that it is as though you were abused. And to smooth over the gaps in your recall of your experience, your brain will actually fabricate such a memory. Um, so the other thing that the hippocampus does, um, well, there's one more thing to add about the right hippocampus and its contribution to spiritual practice. Because it does spatial perception and because it works without words, it does a lot of the cognition, a lot of the contextualization, a lot of the thinking with a small T, not a capital T, a lot of the thinking that's involved when you're doing a spiritual practice. And so there are many spiritual practices that can involve a sense of spaciousness, an expansive, relaxing, remember it's on the same side of the brain where the caudate nucleus, the right side, which on the right side is involved in relaxation. And there it is all queued up for you, the, the green bit there. That one does relaxation. It's been called the visceroemotive integrator because it, it integrates our body state of relaxation or tension with our emotional state. There's a brain part that tells you that anger calls for excitement and a brain part that tells you that meditation, relaxation, schmoozing with your lover calls for relaxation. Uh, the right hippocampus is intimately intergrown with the amygdala on the right side. It's not just connected to it, but the two are actually joined together. So that when one of them is very active, the other tends to become quiet. And what this means is that the hippocampus, through extreme levels of activation, can create a sense of detachment. So that your emotions either don't come up, or they come up but they don't seem terribly important to you. Uh, detachment and equanimity, two of the byproducts of successful spiritual practice, um, actually have to do with these same brain structures that seem to be almost the target that so many of those practices are, are pointed to. Um, and what we have here is a kind of schematic of meditation practice. Uh, the amygdalas, both of them are quieted down. There's no color there showing that they're inactive. The hippocampus is quite active. It's fully colored. The relaxation part, the caudate nucleus on the right, is colored, showing that it's, it's active. Not much emotion. Lots of availability for internal cognition and a state of relaxation, and not many words. Almost every spiritual practice involves suppressing words. Even chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, etc. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. If I have to live in this world, let it be on toasted eggs. These kinds of mental activities keep the language centers busy with a set of words so that other verbal thoughts can't intrude on the practice. Filling your mind with a mantra is, just as so many of these mantra teachers have said, actually a matter of emptying the mind. The other thing about this is that if you were to light up that right hippocampus, the one that's directly above the blue, the active 
hip, uh, the right amygdala, the one that's directly above the blue or active hippocampus. Then you'd be dealing with a similar state that, you would, that your brain would ordinarily be in in moments of extreme fear. In moments of extreme fear, the tiger is jumping at you, the bus is careening down the street at you, your boss is screaming at you, you know, about how you're going to be fired. You start looking for solutions, looking for ways to get out of the situation. And the fewer words it takes to do that thinking, the better your chances for surviving the bus, keeping your job intact, and so forth. You have to think very quickly to find a solution to whatever problem has evoked the fear. So the response to fear is a kind of thinking that doesn't call for words, whereas the response to something happy or pleasant does call for far more words. Moving towards enlightenment, this changes. What we're looking at here is a kind of schematic for meditation, and meditation, more than anything else, prepares a person to become enlightened. In many spiritual traditions, that's what it's for. Some spiritual traditions are a little bit less uh, ambitious, and they won't tell you that meditation is going to make you enlightened. They'll tell you that meditation will calm you down. It'll make life better, but they don't make the highfalutin grand promises of full-blown full -blown enlightenment. But some of them do. And yet, keeping the right hemisphere active in this way keeps uh, keeping the limbic system and the right hemisphere in general activated in this way means that you are, in fact, more prone to have anxiety, fear, and sadness come up. So after these, the silent thinking and relaxation brain parts are already fully tuned and operating regularly for the person because of meditation, something will happen. Um, it can be from something entirely internal or it can be uh, something, some kind of external event. Something actually happens to make us scared. That thing, whatever it is, continues on. And that fear or other negativity, and there's a technical word for this, dysphoria, as opposed to euphoria. The dysphoria increases. Now we've got more right amygdala active. Ordinarily, for a non-meditating mind, when you have a lot of fear, some of that activity can be directed into the parts that think your way out of the process. But here, that brain part is already quite active. There's no, not much room uh, for that extra activity to escape to. So if anything, if it gets even worse, you can find that the right amygdala becomes absolutely maxed out, filled to capacity. You are in a state of terror, the sense of impending doom. Um, just, well, stark terror. But again, the right hemisphere is already pretty active because of long time, long periods spent doing meditation. You've tasked your brain, you've exercised your brain to keep the right side active. Now there's fear there, and it's already maxed out. So you need the activity to escape somewhere else. Where does it go? Across the brain, into the amygdala on the left. The, the two amygdalas speak the same language, even though they create very different experiences when they're, when they're operating. And this is the moment of enlightenment. Activity builds up in the fearful structure, the bad boy structure. There's nowhere else for it to go. It cascades, it avalanches over into the left side. The left amygdala is suddenly and dramatically activated, and the entire moment turns around. What was very unpleasant becomes blissful. Um, it's as though it releases pressure from, this, and I want you, from the right amygdala. And I want you to notice that even after this has happened, the hippocampus on the right, with all of its nonverbal information, continues to work. So you've got a, a huge amount of nonverbal information at work in the brain. Suddenly, everything turns blissful. And the resulting experience is that you're flooded with all kinds of insights, all kinds of intuitions, intimations, hints of things, fragments of higher truths, because now you've got bliss and silent thinking, both operating at their maximum. Um, the left hippocampus stays fairly quiet, um, and uh, the left 
caudate nucleus, the one that does, now does arousal and excitement, and suddenly you have a wave of insight, a wave of bliss, and you are excited. The classical phrase for this in the Buddhist literature is that the Buddha gives his lion's roar. Why a roar? Why a verbal sound? Well, remember, the left is where the language centers are. Jesus says, shout it from the rooftops. Again, this thing needs to be expressed somehow. Everything has turned around. And um, now, I want to direct your attention to the uh, thing that connects the two amygdalas at the top. There's a little structure between the two, the anterior commissure. And all it does is connects the two amygdalas together connects one, kind, one set of emotion to the other set of emotion so that they can modulate and mediate one another. You're in a state of terror because your boss says you're about to be fired. You step out of the office and the secretary comes after and says, he talked to me about the meeting beforehand. He's not going to fire you. He's just trying to scare you a little bit. And then you go, ah. The sense of fear has to be available to, the, to its reduction, to some good news in order for you to actually feel what's appropriate in each moment. Um, but what you'll notice in this illustration is that whereas previously we've got that thing connecting the two round bits, the interior commissure connecting the amygdala, has equal access to both sides. In the next one, um, you'll notice that it's now one side has been pared away. And I'll give you a closer look at it here. Before the moment, activity is um, equally able to move from left to right and right to left. Afterwards, it looks like this. Now the activation is only going to run from the right to the left, from the fear structure to the bliss structure. What's happened? And the answer is that all other conditions being equal, an injury or a sudden shock to the brain will remove inhibitory synapses instead of excitory synapses. It will take out bits, little tiny micro bits of the brain that prevent things from happening far more readily than it will taking out m bits of brain that make things happen. So once this happens, once the inhibitory right to left synapses are pruned away. Thereafter, any activation of the right amygdala will automatically shunt it over into the left. Anytime the fearful amygdala, the fear center is turned on, it's automatically shunted over to the blissful one. And after this comes the perception that there are no problems, that nothing is wrong. Nothing can happen to you that will ever hurt you. There are no threats. You are always safe at all times, in all places. Because you no longer have the capacity to inhibit bliss. Now I realize that that's another shovel full of brain science thrown onto you. And it does involve thinking about inhibitory and excitory synapses. And that can get reasonably complicated quite quickly. I have a question. Is there humming and buzzing and vibrating? I think it's quite possible that there would be. And let me take you back a couple of slides. When that transfer of energy from, and I'll stop using the brain part names to make it simple for you. When, you, when energy is changed from fearful to blissful, jumping over into the left, it will often spill over into the right, I'm sorry, into the left arousal structure, the caudic nucleus. And that is an, a very somatic or body-related structure. So if it's activated suddenly or outside of its usual patterns of activation, you can find unusual sensations happening in the body, including a buzzing sensation. Yes? So this has been observed in research that the inhibitory bodies go away and all you have is stimulatory. This was seen in humans, was seen in PET scan. How, what was the research that this was... Actually, this was worked out uh, studying people who had sustained closed head injuries. And it was published in a paper by Dr. Michael Persinger uh, called Principia Brevita, the Brief Principles for Treating Closed Head Injuries. And there are some 12 
uh, things to look out for that, if, that a doctor should look into and be aware of when he's treating someone who's had that kind of injuries. Um, generally speaking, if you have a closed head injury, nothing, it doesn't crack your skull or open your brain or anything like that, you just get a really bad concussion, enough to shake things up in there. What's going to be shaken loose is inhibitory synapses, and this will mean that all kinds of neural fun functions that are normally suppressed suddenly burst into the person's awareness unexpectedly. So, for example, someone has a serious closed head injury and all of a sudden they find themselves having severe bursts of joy, bursts of anger, bursts of fear. It's, why are my, why are my emotions running amok? And the answer is, well, it's because you lost some of the synapses that ordinarily inhibit these things. And what commonly happens, to anticipate your next very intelligent question, is that um, those functions which are released in this way that the person doesn't like, they throw, without knowing they're doing it, without deliberately intending to, they throw their um, brain's reward and punishment, pleasure and aversion systems into it and do what they can to start building up new inhibitory synapses to, um, to suppress the stuff they don't like and they leave the, the newly activated stuff that they do like alone because that feels good, so why try to suppress it? So over time, the brain accommodates within this new set of rules. And in the course of my work, I've run into a number of people who've had head injuries of different kinds, went through a turbulent period, and when it was over, they said it was one of the greatest things that ever happened to them. Um, there is a, a woman, her name is Taylor. She's a, a neuroscientist, and she had a stroke actually had a golf ball size blood clot removed from her brain afterwards. But she has a phenomenal story to tell. Just look up Taylor and Stroke on YouTube and you will find a video of her telling her story of how she became enlightened as a result of this stroke. And it was a very, very turbulent enlightenment process. By comparison, the Buddhas, which we'll be looking at really soon, um, was a piece of cake. But yes, it's a good question. At any time, you, you want to ask the neuroscientist, how do you know that this claim is valid? What's your evidence? That's, that's what we like. Further question. question. Um, I've studied a meditation practice where they actually tell us to focus on the right side and not and to kind of ignore the left side experiences. In order to cultivate... And I'm wondering if you can speak to that. Uh, you're practicing a meditation that, where you're told to focus on the left side on the right side and ignore the left. Um, well, I would remind you that when you focus on your body, when you focus on the left side, you're activating the right side of your brain. When you focus on the right side of your body, you're activating the left side of the brain. So my guess would be, because you're encouraged to focus your attention in a way that activates the left side of the brain by working with the right side of the body, that the one of the common results of that meditation practice, whatever it would be, would tend to be a blissful and positive emotional state rather than a calm, equanimity, equanimitous state. You're, you're focused on joy more than detachment and you're nodding your head in agreement. So, okay. Okay. So you were practicing a meditation with a group and you were asked to focus on the left and right side of your body, alternately changing body parts, and this threw someone into an epileptic seizure, which was identified as a kundalini awakening. I assume that your question is, why did the person go into a seizure? Uh, I really can't say very much about that, except in general principles, and that is that the locus of a seizure, the beginning point of a seizure, can happen anywhere in the brain. And as you were walked through the exercise, focusing on the left arm, the right arm, left leg, right leg, right earlobe, right left earlobe, and so forth, that you probably triggered a point where for that individual, they were seizure prone. And it's quite possible that by moving the, your attention from one body part to another, left and right, that, you, that that person was able to activate that particular brain part that's involved in uh, controlling, mediating, or perceive, getting perceptions from a particular part of the body attacked that spot in the brain from an angle that was unexpected for them, where their brain had no experience either with that pattern of activation or for resisting it. So they simply went into it. 
So I need to get back to the, uh, to the theme here. Um, enlightenment. And as I said before, the moment of enlightenment will tend to be preceded by something very, very unpleasant. But let's look at the case of the Buddha. The night before he became enlightened, he was attacked by Mara, the, uh, the king of the, the lord of evil. And he was tempted by his four daughters who danced in front of him in, in, in skimpy clothes and in provocative poses. And they had names like um, ambition, greed, lust, and so forth. I don't remember them exactly. But uh, the idea was that anything that could pull him away from his intended path was being put in front of him. And his intended path was certainly not into fear. So eventually, uh, the temptation from the daughters of Mara stopped. And the next thing, he was actually beset by the armies of Mara. This is mythological thinking. And they, they threw spears and arrows at him. And as the, the arrows approached him, they turned into flower blossoms, which fell to his feet in a kind of inadvertently worship. Um, the next morning, uh, as he was gazing at the morning star, he uh, became enlightened. That was the actual moment of it. And what I think was probably happening was that using the power of concentration that he had cultivated over so many years of such intense spiritual practice, um, when he found himself at the dawn after this incredibly turbulent night, we've all had them, not that intense, but we've all had really rough nights. And with as dynamic and focused a brain as the Buddha had just before his enlightenment, a bad night wasn't just bad, it was really awful. Um, he watched the sun come up, and as he watched the sun come up, touch of astronomy here, the morning star followed it, and as the sun got brighter in the sky, the morning star winked out as its light was washed out by the light of the sun. And when so powerful was the force of his concentration on the morning star that when it disappeared, he disappeared along with it. One tiny thread maintaining the sense of self was broken. And when that happened, it became possible for all of that activity to just wash over into the other side of his brain. Now, prior to that, he had set the stage. This is the famous statue of the fasting Buddha, which is currently housed in the, the National Museum of Pakistan, the Lahore Museum. And it shows the Buddha in his emaciated ascetic period, during which, depends on the tradition, he would eat no more food than his hand could hold, one cupped hand, and that was all he would eat for a day. In another tradition, he ate th nothing but three grains of rice per day. In another tradition, he ate three hemp seeds per day. And that was all he would let in. And he became, as you can see from the picture, well, rather thin. He realized that he was only pushing himself to death, that he wasn't pushing himself into liberation or enlightenment. So he gave up this practice. And three days before his enlightenment, he began to eat. And there's even a very specific story. A young maiden from a nearby village named Sujata came and brought him a bowl of rice cooked in milk with honey. And he sat down and he had himself the first real meal, uh, literally in years. They say that before this happened, he rubbed his stomach and felt his backbone. But then because he kept himself at this constant level of pain, his body demanding food, and yet it not coming because he had the wherewithal within to deny himself food. When he finally ate that first handful, and then another handful, and two handfuls of rice cooked in milk with honey, sugars, carbohydrates, and proteins all at once, the load of, of activation that his right amygdala would have dropped away from that one relief alone must have been enormous, and probably set the stage for his enlightenment. His, um, his, le his um, right amygdala may have been emptied out or partially emptied out for a few days before setting the stage for his enlightenment if he had given up meditation when he gave up starving himself. Buddhism as a religion today might not exist. So again, there's this pattern. You have a period of inter inner work where insights, nonverbal information, things that can't be shared, uh, percolate to the surface of your consciousness, followed by a moment of incredible unpleasantness 
enough to overburden the right side of the brain, bursts over to the left, and there it is. Sama Samputasa, the supremely enlightened one. Now, the Buddha has no monopoly on this experience. Something similar happened to Jesus, as those of you who were here for the first lecture may recall. In the life of Jesus, the event just before he teach or goes to the Sea of Galilee and starts gathering his disciples, just before his teaching work, he spent 40 days, 40 days and 40 nights in the desert where he meets who? Satan himself, the prince of evil. And, you know, he, the, Satan tempts him. Turn the stones into bread. Jump off the cliff. The angels will bear you down. And Jesus rebukes him. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Man does not live by bread alone. He encounters Satan. And then something happens and he begins his teaching work. The Bible is silent on what that was. But I'm willing to bet a dollar to a donut, as the saying goes, which these days is <laughs> not the bet that it once was. Um, that what happened was that that was the time in which he awakened and became aware of himself in unity with God, whom he called the Father. And Jesus would, didn't really much care for saying that he was the Son of God. In fact, it was one of his disciples who announced that he was the Son of God. He asked, who, they say, who are you? And he said, who do you say I am? And one of the answers came back, uh, I forget the exact words, but one way or another it implied that he was a manifestation of God, that the acquisition of his Godhead happened very shortly after his meeting with Satan, and it was probably very, very similar to Buddhist enlightenment. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of enlightenment stories uh, very soon. A couple of, uh, some of them I'm sure you won't have heard before. But first, let's look at that other question that I promised you an answer to. Why is it that some Buddhists perform miracles and others don't? Why do some Buddhists have a lot to say? Why do they teach extensively? The Buddha himself filled up a 10-foot shelf of books with his, his scriptural sayings. Um, why do some look into your heart and see what's going on with you and feed it back to you in ways that transform you and others don't. Why do some perform miracles and others not? And when the amygdala on the left, now f after having been fed by a maximum amygdala's load of activation from the right, when that suddenly happens, the activity doesn't just stay there. It can spill out over into other structures. Now, here we have it spilling out in perhaps not the greatest illustration you've ever, you've ever seen, but it's spilling out from the left amygdala into the left temporal lobe where the language centers are. And this is a pattern that we might see in an enlightened person for whom teaching and articulating their insights is very easy. They've got an extra load of activation, new pathways, uh, more ready to go into the left temporal lobe than they, would have had to bef than they would have had before. And that means that they're going to have more linguistic ability than before. So um, the next illustration shows that same spillover now flowing into the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes have lots of jobs, which I'm not going to go into too much, except one of them is our social skills. The frontal lobes are very much involved in relating to other people. Um, both with the complicated social rules that only humans have and in the course of our moment-to-moment -moment relating, kind of common, ordinary kitchen, talking to your husband or wife type of thing. So if you get new pathways into the frontal lobe created, you're going to have an extra load of social skills, which includes the ability to see other people and know, so to speak, where they're at. And this means an enlightened person who can look at you, read your heart, and read your mind with a single gesture, whether it's forceful or fluid, with a single tone of voice, you express yourself and they read all of that, know what it means and can feed it back to you and will instantly know where you are and if they are at all intelligent and versed in multiple meditation practices, they can even assign you a specific spiritual practice to do, which is why there are so many stories from the Hindu and Buddhist traditions of people coming in to see the master. And the master takes one look at him and says, you go chant and here's your mantra. Now go away and come back in three years after you're done chanting five hours a day. You sit down and listen to your breathing. 
instantly. And every time the disciples come back and say, wow, that practice really worked. What amazing insight the master must have. It might go into the parietal lobes, and the parietal lobes are involved in our bodies. Um, one section of the parietal lobe gets input from the body, another section controls the body. Um, there, are more, there are diagrams to illustrate this, but I've already given you guys uh, perhaps just a little more information than you were expecting. Now, we're, it, in a case like this, we're looking for things for the, the enlightened person to do that would involve an extra mastery over bodies. And the two most common ones that you'll have heard of are um, healing by laying on hands. You, they can, many very high and holy beings can put their hands on you and make your illnesses go away. Others can put their hands, usually it happens on the head, and through their hands impart to you the state of consciousness that they are living in so that you can have a moment of their enlightenment experience. And the name for this in uh, Asia is Shaktipat, the direct transmission of Shakti. And uh, we're drawing to a close, but there's time for a couple of more enlightenment stories. This one is Eckhart Tolle, who wrote the book, The Power of Now. And in the introduction to his book, or perhaps it's the first chapter, he says, until my 30th year, I lived in a state of almost continuous anxiety, interspersed with periods of suicidal depression. What part of the brain is involved in, in anxiety interspersed with um, suicidal depression? The amygdala on the right. You guys are learning. I am proud. I am pleased with you, my children. You are all blessed. I am so happy. One night, not long after my 29th birthday, I woke up in the early morning hours with a feeling of absolute dread. The Buddha became enlightened in the early morning hours. This is significant. Melatonin levels are lowering in the brain. That doesn't impose a pattern on the whole brain, but it does make some things a bit easier. Melatonin rising, some, some experiences are easier. Melatonin falling, some others are experience, uh, other experiences are easier. I had woken up with such a feeling many times before, but this time it was more intense than it had ever been. The silence of the night, the vague outlines of the furniture in the room, the distant noise of a passing train, everything felt so alien, so hostile, and so utterly meaningless that it had created in me a deep loathing of the world. The most, most loathsome thing at all, however, was my own existence. So now he's got that dysphoria from the right amygdala, and it's targeted on his sense of self. I cannot live with myself any longer. This was a thought that kept repeating itself in my mind. And suddenly I became aware of what a peculiar thought it was. Am I one or two? If I can't live with myself, then there must be two of me. The I and the self that I cannot live with. Maybe I thought only one of them is real. The man's, on, the man's hitting on all eight cylinders here. He's now actually, through direct perception, apprehending that he's got two senses of self in there. Beautiful is thy wristlet, Lord, but more beautiful thy, thy sword. Terrible to behold or to think of. So stunned by the strange realization that my mind stopped. I was fully conscious, but there were no more thoughts. I felt drawn into what seemed a vortex of energy. It was a slow movement at first and then acceler accelerated. I was gripped by an intense fear. He was pulled into a void. His mind chatter had stopped, and he's in an intense fear. Right hippocampus, the silent brain part, working away. Right amygdala, next door neighbor, working away. And felt myself being sucked into a void an experience that is known to come from stimulation of the right hippocampus. It felt as if the void was inside myself rather than outside. Suddenly, there was no more fear. I let myself fall into that void. I have no recollection of what happened after that. He allowed his neural energy into to be fully taken up by the right hippocampus. It's now locked into the right hemisphere. He's in a state of deep fear. The, all that whole complex of right hemispheric structures are now all clanging away. There's nowhere for the energy to go except into the left amygdala. And I continue. I was awakened by the chirping of a bird outside the window. I had never heard such a sound before. My eyes were still closed, but I saw the image of a precious diamond. Yes, if a diamond could make a sound, this is what it would be like. I opened my eyes. The first light of dawn was filtering through the curtains. Without any thought, I felt 
I knew that there was infinitely more light to light than we realized. The soft luminosity filtering through the curtains was love itself. Tears came into my eyes. He was enlightened. Is, in, is his enlightened lasting? Is, the, is his book a true and correct teaching of the way to enlightenment? I'm not qualified to answer that question. But I do know that his experience is in almost a classical model of enlightenment. Ramana Maharishi, um, an astrologer had told him that he was going to die on a certain day. He lay down when the day came, decided not to surrender, I mean not to resist it. The inevitable was the inevitable was the inevitable. This is India where the astrologer's word is, has an incredible power to guide people's thoughts and opinions. So he says, well, if this is the day of my death, I'm going to die. He didn't want to get hit by a truck. He wanted to lay down and be present with his death if that was what was going to come. His sense of self, the normal sense of self, was extinguished and another one appeared. So in a manner of speaking, he died. But what do you suppose it's like to lie down on the floor and wait for your death, which is coming along in 53, 52, 51 minutes, and then it gets down to the moment? What do you think you're going to feel? With just a little bit of an exercised brain, a flexible, sensitive brain, it wouldn't take too much to go into that incredible terror, that maxed out right amygdala. This is Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. Some say he was a spiritual criminal. There were lots of nasty things done in his name. He, it was a good deal of unpleasantness. One of the reasons I like to include him is, first of all, because I have some firsthand experience with the man myself, and because I don't think that just because you enter a state of perfect bliss means that you enter a state of ideal morality. We have talked, I've talked for an hour now about ideal, perfected, higher states of consciousness. No reference to morality whatsoever. Is it really part of the package deal? Or are the states of consciousness that motivate immoral, counter-adaptive, maladaptive, bad, bad, bad behavior simply also states of consciousness that inhibit the progress towards enlightenment? I think probably it's a, qu it's a case of connection, not cause. Enlightenment doesn't cause morality, and this guy is a great example of it. He worked on himself continuously for years, doing every kind of meditation practice imaginable. By the time his book on the various practices were published, there were 108 of them in the collection. And he whipped himself into a state of dissociation and space outedness that was really, really extreme. He got himself to the point where he literally couldn't think. And... Um, one night, after a very intense process that lasted a week, he found himself having an experience of light and bliss. He couldn't be inside his little room. He was a student at the time. He had to get outside. Increasing the amount of space around him, tasking the hippocampus on the right, that spatial perception structure again. You know, these themes of space and inner maps, they actually all do come together when you look at the nuts and bolts of spiritual transformation. He found himself drawn to a garden where he actually had to climb the wall to get to the garden. All the trees were glowing. One of them glowed more brightly than the rest. And he went and sat underneath it. And while he was sitting underneath the Malshri tree at Jabalpur, it happened. And all he could say about it was that it was a benediction that could not be described. It was beyond all words. You wouldn't think these guys are gonna, are, would come into a talk about enlightenment, but they do. I have a story, a person communicated to me from my website after reading an article on enlightenment that's there, and the website is spiritualbrain.com. Look for the article on the Buddha and you'll find much of what we've discussed. This woman was on antidepressants for years, and when she went off of them, the brain parts that were involved in maintaining her depression were, had all the controls removed and she went into a state of depression and anxiety that was so unbelievably bad that it actually broke reality apart for her. And one day she had an awakening experience after which she didn't need the pills anymore. The fearful structure was suppressed by a group of um, uh, tranquilizers, primarily clonopin for years. They were withdrawn. 
the bad boy structures once again burst into activity, only this time without any chemical controls on them whatsoever. It maxed out the fearful structure, the amygdala on the right, the activity spilled into the amygdala on the left, and voila, she's enlightened. She is now a practicing spiritual teacher, actually, in Marin. The only other thing, I just skipped a story there, but time is, is running out, though it's been delightful. The only other thing for me to talk about here is the experience of gradual enlightenment. I've been talking about sudden enlightenment all the way through this. And it's the one that sheds the light that we need in order to understand the gradual kind of enlightenment. Here again are our brain structures. Red means you don't want it active. Green means you do want it active. How do you attain enlightenment gradually? First of all, it's like getting to Carnegie Hall. The guy with the trombone under his arm stops the guy in Times Square and says, excuse me, can you tell me how to get to Carnegie Hall? And the man answers, practice, keep practicing. How do you get to gradual enlightenment? You practice and you keep practicing. You don't let up. Now, when you're sitting in meditation and your meditation is an object is your breath, you're not supposed to pay attention to anything but your breath. If your mind wanders into thinking, you stop and you go back to your breath. If a wave of emotion comes over you, you disconnect from it as much as you can and you be aware of your breath. If your body aches from the meditation posture or you have a little tickle, disconnect from it go back to your breath. If you're chanting a mantra, return to the mantra, whatever it is. What this does is it gives, it exercises your mind and along with it your brain to avoid things that you don't want to be experiencing. Now when you're in meditation, that's everything except the meditation object. When you're not meditating, you now have a choice. You have tremendous skill from these demanding, rigorous, constant practices in disconnecting from things. So you have a moment of fear. Disconnect. Don't put your energy there. Don't go there. You have a moment of irritation. Disconnect. Find another way of experiencing the thing that has irritated you. You find that your body has a pain. Disconnect. Put your mind on something more pleasant. You keep this up for years, for months, for years for decades, for a lifetime. And what you'll find is that because of that use dependency rule of the brain's function, if you don't use it, you lose it. Turn that around. In order to lose it, don't use it. And by systematically atrophying your capacity for fear, anger, irritation, depression, what have you, you will slowly cut away at the synapses that support that until the strongest set of synapses are the ones that focus your attention, your, your states of consciousness onto joy, bliss, silent thinking. And the reason that the caudate nucleus has no color in this illustration is that you have the choice. Do you want to be relaxed? You can go there. You want to be aroused and excited? You want to stand on the rooftop of the temple and give that lion's roar, shout it across the rooftops of the world? You have that option too. Gradual enlightenment means slowly disconnecting from the structures that enlightenment suddenly disconnects you from. But whereas with enlightenment, you don't have a lot of choice about what comes after. Will it spill here? Will it spill there? With gradual enlightenment, you do have a lot of control. And we've gone a couple of minutes over, and I thank you all for your patience. I'll take questions in a second. Here is our closing logo. There we are. Thank you all.